Welcome to Spiritual Study Session 39. Today, we are covering the wide array of Egyptian goddesses. Now, before diving into Egyptian mythology, it's worthy to note that these gods and goddesses are much more fluid. Their attributes blend together where you're not sure how much distinction there is between one and another. Um, we will we'll see this very elaborately throughout the talk, but something to note is that only later in, say, the Greeks, was there more of a concrete categorical model that was ascribed to certain paganisms. Uh, this time period, the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, bleeds all the way back into the Paleolithic. So the development of this paganism is old and far stretching. So the fluidity of this makes sense. Um, and everything that we're looking at today is a good um, marker of the midway point between ancient shamanic worship to modern paganism. Now, it's going to take me a bit before I can discuss the goddesses by name, because in order to do so, we need some context in order to rightly understand. There is this concept of the Eye of Ra. And of course, Ra is the central deity, the sun god of Egyptian mythology. But the Eye of Ra is a sort of force that protects the wishes of Ra. So it's not Ra himself, per se. It is an extension of Ra. Now, there is the sun, but this eye of Ra is likened to the circle that outlines the sun. So you're seeing different deities in one object. Nah. These other deities that comprise the circle that outlines the sun is the eye and goes under many names, mute, Wajet, Sekhmet, Basket, uh, or Bastet, Hathor, a lot more as we'll see. And these often comprise uh, mothers, siblings, daughters of the sun god. Um, what is renewed every day when the sun is reborn at dawn? And yes, the idea here is that Every night, Ra dies and is given birth to again each day, which for our context, if you were on the last session about the cosmogony, death is likened to sleep. So to create the universe is to wake up. So this is to say something to the effect of a kind of like mind numbing statement Every night when you go to bed, you die. <laughs> and when you wake up, it's a whole nother universe. <laughs> and this is, this is the Egyptian mentality, at least when it applies to the god or the gods or the pantheon. So this eye of Ra would be changed in this fluid nature to the eye of Horus and back and forth and back and forth, depending on the time period and where we're talking about. When it comes to his defenders that make up this Eye of Ra, these are lionesses or cobras or some sort of royal authority. They are protection. Um, and the, sig the symbol that always designates if they are a part of the Eye of Ra is the Ureus. U-R-A-E-U-S. You can look into that if you want. Now, certain parts of this Eye of Ra are more aggressive than others. There can be tremendous damage 
um, that can come from the eye of Ra. And ideally, it should be in its more benign state. So what's it saying here? You think I'm talking about deities, right? You think I'm talking about spirituality or whatever this is, right? But this is a direct statement of the Egyptians knowing of solar flares. That the corona, I know it's not a very topical word, the corona of the sun exudes the solar flares. And this is likened to a rampage of the eye of Ra. <laughs> How did they know about this? Hmm? Oh, man. And interestingly enough, this goes a lot deeper than what I'm giving credit. And this would inspire many cults ascribed to the many goddesses. The one that we'll discuss later is the mystery cult of Isis. So, you know, pay attention to when you wanted to invoke the protection of the pharaohs or the protection of the people or these sacred places, right? Um, you ought to be in a good place if you want to call on this protection because it's it's honoring the ultimate truth of things and brings justice where it's due. So there, there'd be some hesitancy in doing so. Now, here's another trippy concept when it comes to understanding the mentality of the ancient Egyptians. The sun is one eye of Ra or Horus, and the moon is the other eye, the left eye of Ra. Let's just say Ra for now. So think of this, right? To look up in the sky and to see these celestial eyes peering in. <laughs> this yellow and red disc, this sun symbol, is always atop in uh, uh, the deity associated with this eye of Ra or the right eye of Ra. And so when you see these depictions of these ancient deities, if you see that sun, then this is your reference. It's all a reference to the eye of Ra. And so this disc too, um, this shape, I just want to reiterate is Ra in the middle and the outline, including all the gods uh, in that outline. This destructive aspect of the heat of the sun and its ability to destroy evilness or those that go against the harmony of the universe or what the Egyptians call Mat. That is the idea. All of these deities and physical phenomena that come from the sun are forces to set order in the universe over chaos. And a reference here too that we should touch on is that this is what you could say is the beginning of the concept of the all-seeing eye. Because the, as the sun rotates and as the moon rotates and the eyes are always on the sky, they will always see everything that happens. So nothing escapes the eyes of truth or the eyes of Ra. <laughs> so here's some esotericism for you. And in a reference to this, Hathor is one of them. And they call her Hathor, and we'll talk more about her later, Hathor of Four Faces. And this is talking of the four directions, the, the eyes seeing in all four directions, you know, the compass directions. Hmm. These, I, uh, these also, I did a snake talk a long time ago, and these references to these snakes that would spit fire. Well, this is also a reference to the eye of Ra. The spitting of the fire is the spitting of the sun, which is not just um, heat, but is also more supernatural things, more metaphysical things, the inconveniencing of evildoers. So 
before I start talking about these specific goddesses, I want to reiterate that they are blending together, that they are primordial beings that don't have fixed places. This is not categorical. This is a lot more wooey. And so if you feel confused, then that is the very nature of what we're working with here. <laughs> It'd be easy to blame my presentation. <laughs> and so many of them don't have good origins or their origins change or their attributes change. So it's this and that. Anyway, the first one I want to talk about is Mahatwaret. And this name means the great flood. Interesting. And this is a reference to those primordial waters, the Nun, the, the thing before creation. And this is where this goddess arises before anything else in, in some creation stories, in some creation myths. And like we were seeing last week, there are many different creation myths. Which one is true? I don't know. Take your pick, right? That's the same sort of thing. So she gives birth to the sun in the beginning of time. And she's portrayed as a cow with a sun disc between her horns. Now, I want to tackle this right away. She is depicted as a cow, and we've noted this several times over in the course. The connection here is the uterus, the shape of the uterus and the fallopian tubes, that this shape or this uh, pattern, the symbol, is referred to as cow. That is the direct analogy. So what does the cow do and what does the uterus do? <laughs> it creates by these standards, right? It creates. And the mother provides and it nourishes. So this is what it means by the celestial cow or these cow goddesses. And it's not just Mehet Weret. It's like Isis, it's like Hathor, it's like Neith. And you see this all across the world. We saw this in Norse. We saw this in Hindu. And it's beyond that. I'm not going to get to touch on all that right now. And of course, she is a part of the Eye of Ra. Get used to hearing that. So accordingly, she is the goddess of the waters, creation and rebirth. So the one that makes living possible and the one that like helps you to live. The mother. The provider. So this is an interesting take, right? Because in this way, the main head honcho god, Ra, is not the first thing. The first thing is the mother. And that should make perfect sense, right? <laughs> I mean, unless we're Abrahamic, right? <laughs> Anyhow, so as I mentioned, this is the deity that gives birth to Ra every day. And this is the reason why the world is not shrouded in chaos and darkness, is because of this birth that she gives. And that's why this sun is in between her horns. The horns are also an emblem of protection. She is protecting the sun. And so the sun is between her horns. She was responsible for taking the son into the underworld at night and then bringing him back the next day. And this is an ancient trope that we see all across religions, mostly esoterically at this point, the descent into the underworld and the resurrection. But for the Egyptians, this happened every day. So yeah, apply that elsewhere. And over time, we see that Hathor, one that I've mentioned and that one that I'll mention later, will subsume these characteristics of, Me of Mehet Meret. And the difference here is that this heavenly cow, this celestial cow, this Mehet Meret is a lot more caring, seemingly more caring. And Hathor is much more uh, 
troublesome, let's put it that way, or perhaps more chaotic or, or more aggressive? The other one is Neith, which is the name that I used in the creation stories last week, which is the same or is different. Welcome to the confusion. Neith is shown carrying a scepter and the Ankh, as many of them do. And by the way, the scepter is a symbol of power and of ruling. And the Ankh means life, life itself. And we can devote a whole different session to these symbols. But Neith is referred to as the cow of heaven. And she is likened to Mahetweret and is also likened to the great flood and is known as the protectress of the royal house and bears the symbol of the Urius with the sun above. That reference to the eye of, of Ra and is thought to be the direct personification of the primordial waters of creation. Thus the flood thing again. So this is the archetypal great mother goddess, the primordial goddess, the one that gives birth to all, to all things. And that she was created of herself. She was not given birth to. She is self-created. There's an emblem of purity here. The name also derives down to mean to pour, like water pouring. The first creator. <laughs> the one that decides how all things are governed. So how many attributes can we give to a deity, deity such as this? The one that weaves the cosmos that represents mothers, that represents waters, that represents childbirth. And then how many things can we throw in here? We're throwing in wisdom, hunting, war, and fate. And obviously fate because all things are included here. Now that's the difference between Mahetweret and, and Neith is this war attribute. So this is a part of secret society, initiatory rites, mystery cults of Egypt, is this concept of this uh, primal, primordial goddess deity that is self-created. There's a lot more that goes into this than I think, e even though Egyptian mythology is a wealth of information for us, we have more information on on this mythology than we do many others. But still yet, I don't think we could ever pierce the membrane of what real esotericism can be, can be found in this. So likewise, this one, Neith, is depicted as a little bit more agitated. She would be the one that guards bodies after they have died from being disgraced. She is also symbolized by having a loom, which again is for weaving. And that's a reference to the weaving of fate. And so this is where we can make a tie-in. There's not so many of these, but this is a good direct tie-in in a loose form to Athena in the Greek tradition. And, and what it is, is the loom, the weaving of fates, the weaving of the world. And so Neith here too is, strangely enough, uh, in one creation myth, also the mother of Apophis or Apep. So she is both the mother of the order, which is symbolized by Ra, and the chaos as symbolized by Apep. And for those that don't know, these two are feuding forever. Apep is always trying to eat Ra, and Ra is always trying to slay Apep. Order versus disorder, the main metaphysical attribute um, worshipped by the Egyptians to bring order over chaos. 
And so here we have the mother that is giving birth to both duality. So I hope you can feel how, how deep this is treading, which it should, right? A pep was created when the mother goddess spit into the waters of Nun. And this gave birth or created or amalgamated, frost up the Lord of Chaos. So in the more practical attributes of the contemporary pantheon, I shouldn't say contemporary, but you know what I mean. She's the one that speaks on, uh, is the mediary between the gods, between humanity and the gods, and between the gods and humanity. So she is the mediary between all things because she is the one that gave birth to all things. So included in all things. <sighs> and everything that would come, all the subsequent deities, and all aspects of water, both from the primordial chaos and when it came to the Nile, which is, you know, very sacred, comes from Neith. And that she would be stitching with her loom every day. Every day. Didn't just do it once. Constant creation. Constant novelty. And this is where it's interesting because... I said self-created. So she was described as the virgin mother goddess. Now you don't have to take this too far to see where I could be going with that. So this next one is Tefnut, primordial goddess. Again, daughter of Ra. So not the mother, but daughter of Ra, the wife and sister of Shu, the god of light and air, and the mother of Nut and Geb the sky and the earth. And this name ties her to this concept of moisture, but it's both, it's a duality here. It's both moisture and the lack thereof. So the control over both. So all rain, all dew, um, the, the humidity in the air controlled by Tefnut. And thus is also a lunar goddess represented by the left eye of Ra. Because as we know, the moon has control over the tides and the oceans and the water therein. As did the ancient Egyptians know. So she of the moisture, she of the spit is another way of, of thinking of it. <laughs> depicted as a lioness, which we're not going to get sick of hearing that. She also wears a solar disc, Eye of Ra reference, circled by two cobras and the Urius. So the circling of two cobras, right? Do we have a Caduceus reference there? She is also holding a scepter and also is holding the Ankh, breath of life, power, and sometimes takes the form of a cobra. So it's not just this moisture, as I mentioned, it's also the opposite. So she was sometimes also called the lady of the flames because she could create the dryness. And we see as, as it descends from the mother of creation who was kind and caring, as we take steps down, we see that they become more aggressive, as I've been saying. And in one story, Tefnut is upset with her father, Ra, and so she takes the moisture out of the atmosphere of Egypt. And this is what makes Egypt barren. This is what makes the deserts. This is the origin story from Tefnut. So you can see here, this is a good tie to the shamanic. Because as we know, with native stories, with aboriginal stories, their uh, um, deities, the stories of their deities and their, and their worship explains the physical environments around them through storytelling. So again, this is such a great bridge. So next I wanna talk about Nut, which is the next in the line. A woman depicted as, as naked and covered in stars. So she is the goddess of the sky. Now I've mentioned before, but it's interesting to note here that the God of the earth in Egyptian is a man and the goddess of the sky is a female or a woman. And this is oftentimes opposite in most mythologies. The trope in most mythologies is the opposite. 
Now, she would be the one guiding the souls of the dead to the stars and making stars out of them. She is symbolized by a pot that represents a womb. Now, realize the omega sign, too, the omega sign, and how much that looks like a cauldron or a pot. And then think, too, of this reference of the womb, and think, too, of the reference of the cow and its likeness to the... <laughs> I'm forgetting. Uh, the uterus. There's also a symbol that is known as a maquette. And this is a ladder that was used to help Osiris escape in one of the lures. And also the ladder into the skies of which the souls go. And she's, of course, depicted as a cow. But there's also this reference to being depicted as a sycamore tree. Now, why a sycamore tree? So the sycamore tree was thought to be um, aiding the dead, that the roots of the sycamore tree would feed food and water to those that lived in the underworld. And there's also this uh, secretion from the fruits that is white, which is likened to milk, thus tying it to these goddesses, which we'll see that it's more than one that's represented by the sycamore. And so she would have been very important to mention during funerals. And so here she is, it, it, as it says, that the end of each day, she swallows Ra. She swallows the whole sun and gives birth to him the next day. But this is confusing, right? Because it's also the daughter. It's the daughter uh, or the granddaughter of Ra. But we saw that was happening with the mother of Ra. <laughs> so right away, we need to pay attention here. The grandmother, the mother, the, the, the daughter, and the granddaughter. This is um, putting a semblance, a line between all of them. Oh, gosh. There was a tale where she wanted to help Ra escape from the realms of the earth. So she turned into a giant cow and she lifted him into the heavens. And four gods came to help when she couldn't lift him any further. And these four gods became the four pillars of creation, known as the four winds, known as the four directions. So this is a kind of setup of all of material existence in these tales. She who holds a thousand souls. She who gives food and wine to the dead. She who is drawn in the lids of coffins for the dead. She who bore the gods. Nut. And as a story I was given in the cosmogony, she is separated from a romantic embrace with the earth. And they realized that the creation could not move forward unless she was separated from her love. And so Shu pried them away from each other, which is a myth that we see all across the world, as I've mentioned before. But an, another interesting note here is that she, at one point in the mythology, was cursed by Ra because of her relationship with her own brother. And he, in this curse, made her, uh, refused her the right to give birth during any month of the year. And so Nut went to Thoth, the god of wisdom, and they cooked up a plan and they tricked the moon into giving the year five extra days so that she could give birth during these five extra days of the year. So this is a direct explanation for why there aren't 360 days in the year. And that's a good question. Why aren't there just 360 days? If there are six, 360 degrees to a circle, right? Something's not right here. And so here you have an explanation for it in myth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, Hather, as I've mentioned plenty of times before, 
sky deity, not too far off, right, from Newt and from some others mentioned. The symbolic mother of all pharaohs and the consort of Horus, not Ra, sometimes Ra, sometimes Horus. She is the vengeful aspect, the protective aspect of Ra. She enjoys dancing, sexuality, maternity, music. And so you see this kind of artsiness, right? This more swangness, this more sauntering-ness coming out of these deities, these, these goddesses as they're coming through. So Hathor would be the one that seamlessly moves between the realm of the dead and the realm of the living, helping souls to transition in life. And again, we're seeing this across the board with these goddesses, symbolized as a cow with the sun between her horns, as a sycamore tree, symbolized as a lioness, and symbolized as a cobra. <laughs> Man. This protection aspect of why it's protecting in childbirth, of why these deities are protecting um, children, right? And why the cow thing, right? And that the, the horns are trying to hug the sun in its protection. They're moving inward. And how, you know, uh, cows are giving milk to give nourishment at this point, not just to their own kin, or not kin, well, yeah, I guess so, to their own children, but also to humans now, right? The giving, the giving, the giving, and giving, and giving, and giving. The givingness of the mother. So thus, Hathor is called the mother of all mothers. The mother of mothers. Women, fertility, children, and childbirth. The one who protects and helps alleviate complications of childbirth. And assists in all manner of health and beauty and matters of the heart. Have heartbreak? Call upon Hathor. And you would think that this would seclude such goddesses to just worship by females, but there were both male and female priests of Hathor. And so this is the difference here uh, and that I want to talk about right now is Egypt was a really big place, but most notably there was this division between beliefs that you would find in upper and lower Egypt before their unification. And so Hathor is more represent representative of upper Egypt, whereas a deity that we're going to talk about later, Bast or Bastet, was the, the, the analogous representation found in Lower Egypt. So it's not that they don't get along. They're just different names with some different attributes that are ultimately the same thing. Now, here's something important that I want to mention. She was decided to be the personification of the Milky Way. So what? What are we saying here? The Milky Way. Why is it called the Milky Way? Hmm, all these references to the heavenly cow. The story saying that the Milky Way was flowed from the from the udders of the heavenly cow. <laughs> oh, yay. Lady of the stars. Was given her own month called Hethara, and this was the third month of the year. She was associated with turquoise and malachite. Gold and copper. Mistress of turquoise, lady of malachite. And an interesting note here, the Egyptians would grind up malachite to use for um, protection in eye infections. And oh, man. there's this concept too, where if you were an artist of any kind, a dancer of any kind, this would be your lady. Hathor would be your lady. Imagine the archetypal, uh, spiritual, and free-willed lady, Hathor. And that's who you'd call upon for the arts. And there's also this concept of the seven Hathors. And this was a reference to fate and to fortune-telling, that the seven Hathors knew the fates of all children, that the oracles that worshiped Hathor and the seven Hathors would be the ones to interpret the dreams of children and people. So if you wanted divination, you would go to the priests of Hathor who specialized in the seven Hathors. And this reference of seven is a reference perhaps to the Pleiades, 
that we've seen reoccurringly throughout <laughs> all religions. And also, just like what the Christians did, they made these seven deities and seven hathers and the seven stars of the Pleiades associative with seven cities, just like with the, the Christians did with different churches. And in the case of the seven hathers, you have uh, Heraklepolos, Keset, uh, Momemphis, Sinai, uh, Aphroditopolis, uh, Heliopolis, uh, and Thebes. And so in time here, yet again, we're seeing that Hathor bleeds more into the background, even though she was a big deal. And who's taking this over? It's Isis. Isis takes over. And that's the name that most people associate. So let's talk about Isis instead, the goddess of a thousand names. The divine one, the queen of all gods, the queen of heaven, the maker of sunrise, the mother of God. The Greeks also worshipped Isis in their own ways, associating her with Athena, Aphrodite, Persephone, Tethys. She was the wife of Osiris, the mother of Horus. Not too far off, right? Fertility goddess. Well, why fertility? Mm, the one that provides. Huh. The one that creates. Huh. Goddess of magic. Now, here's an interesting note. When Ra was old and frail, here's the lore, and he was drooling upon himself, she took some of that and mashed it together with the earth and created a poison and fed it into Ra and told Ra, I will only cure you and you will only live if you give me the name of wisdom, the name, your name. And so he did. And so she gained occult magical powers, or as we know the name, she gained Hekka. Mm. She gave that power to Horus. And that's what Horus, that's how Horus eventually became more of the head honcho than Ra. And so here's her triad, right? She's between Osiris, Horus, and Isis, right? Those are the triad, the three deities, Osiris, Horus, Isis. That Isis would be the one that was nursing Horus or that nurses the Pharaoh. And her aspect of this motherliness and this purity of Isis is a direct inspiration for the Virgin Mary. Now, I've said this of the many goddesses that have come before, but the self-created one at the beginning, I feel like is more of an attribute. Now, this is controversial, but these ideas were all around before Christianity came to be. Now, where did Christianity take place most of the time? A big swath in Egypt, right? So you can't, you can't say coincidence too much when it comes to spiritual studies. Ah. <sighs> So since she had this occult knowledge, the priest would cure illnesses and would celebrate festivals. When would they celebrate these festivals? They would celebrate these festivals at the five days at the end of the year. Now, huh, something to say about that, right? Because yet again, the five days that were added by the moon and Thoth so that Nut could give children. And the resemblance between Nut and Isis and all these other deities, right? So I don't know. There's some, there's some thread here that, that I'm getting a taste of. Okay, so symbols associative. She's a cow. <laughs> Scorpions and snakes. And this is that, that power. The power is what is, is uh, noticed by the Egyptians when it comes to representations of the scorpion and snake. But also we have symbols of the dove now was the virgin mary symbol oh the dove hmm, what a coincidence also the hawk the swallow and the vulture and we'll talk more about the vulture later now there's also this reference of a symbol called the thet t-h-e-t -E the knot of isis yet again another form of a stylized uterus this color of red as you see it in these depictions of deities in Egypt 
is a is a substance that represents blood and subsequently life. So the mysteries of Isis, the cult of Isis, this is something that spread across Greece and Rome beyond the Egyptians. But the Greeks weren't um, unfamiliar with secret initi initiatory rites. There were the initiations of Demeter, which isn't too far off from Isis. Uh, there were also the initiations of Dionysus. And of course, the Eleusian mysteries, which aren't far from this at all. So how much can really be known about these mystery cults, right? Because that's the idea. They're mystery. Uh, but you could say that part of these initiations were to go through a process of symbolic death and rebirth, facilitating a visionary, religious, spiritual experience and was said to bring a person to be able to see the gods. Now, there have been ties of the mystery cults of, Eleu of Eleusis, at least, to the use of psychoactive uh, visionary drugs. Um, probably not Anamita Mascara, probably more like Ergot of Rye or what creates LSD. But anyhow, it's this act that people enter voluntarily that you sign yourself up for that you are initiated by being put into darkness for a long time sensory deprivation and then a bright light and loud music strobes at you in this state which induces disorientation and facilitates this religious experience and mind you i'm cutting a lot of details here because there'd probably be all sorts of use of incense and other uh, herbs of various proportions and that this is tied this this act was also mentioned when it comes to study of the Eleusian initi initiations and this is mirroring Persephone's dive into the underworld to pass into the dark hall where you are subjugated to terrifying visions and then the light of the hierophant washes over you so i can't say much more about the, these initiations other than the type of uh, simulating of the afterlife as it was believed by whoever is running these initiations and eventually the cult of isis beyond europe in in greece and rome would be stamped out as christianity came up and would go into hiding after it was persecuted starting at the year 535 and really got kicked off this this persecution of these got kicked off in alexandria of all places when the early christians um were hacking the statues to pieces but anyhow let's move on nephthys nephthys now at a certain point the ennead and the ogdode these different groups of gods uh, in these different traditions of Egyptian mythology blended together. And Nephthys would step up out of this. She is translated to mean the, the mistress of the house. Now, this house could be a reference to Egypt, could be a reference to the royals, um, or could be a reference to a constellation, huh? You know, houses. And she would be the wife of or the counterpart to Set. And Set is often depicted as the bad dude of, of, these, of these various mythologies within Egyptian. So Set is the desert. And Nephthys is air. So Set was said to be infertile. And Nephthys was barren. And she, being the heir, was symbolized by a vulture. Now, here's an interesting belief. The Egyptians did not think that vultures gave birth or did not have children. They thought that all vultures were female. And that they literally were spawned from the air. 
They were spontaneously created from the air. And this subsequent association with death, which we don't need to be explained why, right? Because they're scavengers. And so Nephthys, in the same way, is the goddess of death and mourning. And so people who are professional mourners, which yes, that is a thing, and jump over to Irish mythology, and you have the sirens. They, except in Egypt, here it was called the Hawks of Nephthys. And Nephthys, being of the air, is the one that protects your lungs. So she's not all bad. Because mind you, death here is a very different concept to cultures well beyond our own. So she would be the one protecting women in childbirth. Mm, I've heard that a few times. But she is sister to Isis. And so the association here is that these sisters are death and life. Nephthys and Isis are yin and yang. And there's these tales of how Nephthys uh, moves to um, fornicate, procreate, seduce Osiris, either through drugging him or taking the form of Isis to seduce him. Now, this is a way that the Egyptians explained a flower popping out of nowhere in a barren desert. So yet again, we're seeing the example that ties back to the shamanic. The myth is explaining how flowers can manage or anything can manage to bloom where it seems that nothing should bloom. The miraculousness of nature. And the explanation here is that Nephthys has seduced Osiris. Interesting. I find it interesting. So Isis, Nephthys, night and day, life and death, growth and decay. And to those that would represent Isis and Nephthys, they would shave all of their body hair and would represent them by being ritualistically pure. Interesting, right? So let's start moving to more subsidiary goddesses. Curiosity goddesses. <laughs> Wadget. I've mentioned her in the snake talk. This is the snake headed goddess. Protector of lower Egypt, but eventually all of Egypt. Protector of kings. Protector of women in childbirth. <laughs> Nurse of the infant Horus associated with Isis, as well as all these other goddesses. Hmm, I wonder why. Symbol of the Urius on her head, holding an ankh. Hmm, haven't heard that one before, but here's something new. Wadget was said to create the first papyrus plant, which we all know how important papyrus became. You know, papyrus to paper, to digital computer. <laughs> so, uh, yet again, and I haven't mentioned it with a lot of these deities, but yet again, part of the Eye of Ra. Wadget was the daughter of Ra and was sent to find um, Ra's missing children, which we talked about the story before. Uh, once the children are found, Ra sheds a tear, or Atum, depending on the name, sheds a tear, and that tear becomes humanity. Well, who's the one that actually found them? It wasn't Atum, it was Wadget. Wadget's the one that found the missing children in the waters of Nun, the ones who got lost in the waters of Nun. But to reward Wadget, Ra wanted to place her upon his head so that she would be close to him and could protect him and help him in times of need. So here's the reference to why the pharaohs have a snake protruding out of their crowns. It goes all the way back to these origin stories, these creation stories. 
So Wadget is the protector. The snake here is the protector, spitting uh, fire. The Eye of Ra. <laughs> she is closely associated with Mat. And as I've mentioned before, justice, balance, the harmony of the universe, order over chaos. So she is the one that comes to make things right. So she's loyal and earnest in this way. The snake that serves a direct purpose. So anybody who went against the rules of order, the order, order, actual order, like for good attributes, not corrupt order, but good attributed order. She would attack them. She would be the vengeful spirit that goes, that goes against evil, all manner of evil. So cleaning up the actions of evil, anything that was against Mott, she would be the one to punish. Now, in mirroring this, we move to a different deity, Mafdet except as not a snake, but perhaps the first cat deity. Now, here's some interesting notes here. So she is personified, not just as a cat. Mafdet's not just as a cat, a cheetah, a leopard, a mongoose, and a lynx, even a panther. <laughs> she who runs. And by that, the one that makes justice swift. Execution, protecting the order, all as they do in the eye of Ra. So for this deity, Mafdet, the symbol is the pole and the blade of execution. Now, why the pole? Well, cats like climbing up poles. <laughs> it really might be that simple, people. And so, as opposed to where the snake is powerful, Mafdet is playing more of the opposite approach because she's the one that protects against venomous bites. So not just snakes, but scorpions. So she is the one that protects from poison. The protector of raw, protector of people, the one that protects from all manner of poison from bites and stinks. Deadly venoms protects the Pharaoh and the people from all of the evils that could come from the underworld. Protector of sacred places, protector of tombs. Would deliver the evildoers at the feet of the Pharaoh and coined as the avenger of the king. A cat. Now, this is the earlier mention of the cat deity. The later mention of which I've mentioned before already in this talk is Bastet. And this would become the more popular cat deity. So Bastet is the one that protects the home, women's secrets, and fertility, also childbirth, and wards off evil spirits and diseases from the home or what have you would guide the dead in the afterlife sometimes, not all the time, but could do so. Now, here's the reference I want to say here. The ancient Egyptian belief on cats were that they were demigods <laughs> because they were all believed to be embodiments of Bastet. And why are they gods? Why are they so good? Because they're beneficent. They protect the crops. The crops give us life. And by killing these vermin, they're protecting us from disease. They are protecting the order and keeping chaos away. So these cats are doing everything to bring people good health, happiness. So in her form, as the archetype behind all cats, she had the head of a cat but also a female body, as all the deities do. They're all anthropomorphized with the body in that way. So as Ra, 
And here's a different story, right? Sometimes Ra is swallowed up at night when he's riding his chariot across the sky and goes into the underworld. When he's sleeping, this is another way of putting it, sleeping to wake up to the next creation. Who's protecting the boat, the chariot as it rides across the seas of space? It's Bastet. Bastet is protecting him as he sleeps. And what does the cat do? That's the idea. The cat is protecting you as you sleep. How much more beneficent can it get? And so at night, Bastet herself would turn into a cat to protect Ra from a pep, from Apophis. Chaos. And so along with being protective, she is known by many names. Goddess of the moon. Cats associations with the moon, anybody? Lady of the eye of Ra goddess of the rising sun because she's protecting that sun it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been rising if she didn't protect it and the all-seeing eye now that's the interesting thing here right so it's not just the eyes in the sky if bastet is embodied through all of these cats across the world then it's kind of like a surveillance but it's the good type of surveillance. It's protecting you. So to those that would still believe or whatever, you know, uh, Basquette would be still alive and still thriving through the cats in your house. <laughs> now, two more. Sekhmet, brief mention. She who is powerful the one who is in love with Mott, order. The one uh, who keeps out uh, by dangerous means. The goddess of the desert, plague, chaos, war, and healing. She was created from the fire of the sun in Ra's eye. So maybe a solar flare reference yet again. She was initially created, it was said, to be the means to destroy humanity for disobeying. Now, this would only be the case if humanity was not following the principle of Mat. If humanity was a curse, a scourge upon the world, they would be destroyed. Now, isn't that a little poetic, huh? It's got some contemporary problems that might threaten our very existence in the grand scheme. Hmm. Sekhmet would be that disaster because the idea would be to continue order. That order is the ultimate thing. Harmony is the utopia that reality was made to cook up. So how is she depicted? As a lion. Fierce. A lioness. Huh? Got some cat in there too protector of the pharaohs, but in warfare, most notably, in warfare, protecting them. And in the calmer state, she would take on the form of the cat goddess Basquet. So, Bastet. So, this is that direct fluidity that I mentioned before. Who are we talking about? Sekhmet or Basquet? And so Sekhmet, in, in this flavor, though, as opposed to Bastet, is much more terrifying. But while she can bring the plague, while she can bring disease and all manner of illness, she can heal anything. But what does it mean? You will be healed if it's all in service of Mat. But if it's not, she'll plague you. <laughs> this is kind of the keep you in line sort of deity here the fierce goddess, which we've seen in various religions. So she could cure anything. And when people would want something cured, they would offer her music, they would burn incense, they would leave out food, and they would whisper their wishes into the ears of cats. And this is why they would treat cats so well, because they knew that they were a direct feed to the gods. Isn't that fascinating? I love that. 
And our last one, mute or mutt. I'm going to say mute, M-U-T. A lioness deity associated with Upper Egypt, as opposed to her counterpart in Lower Egypt, Sekhmet. You see how these keep bouncing off each other like this? So for the Upper Egypt, mute. She's a woman of wings, like a vulture. Mm, another vulture reference. Holding an ankh with a crown. But is depicted with red and blue. And at her feet has the feather of Mott. Oh, another deity who's in love with Mott. Maintaining the harmony. Depicted as a cobra, a cat, a cow, or a lioness. Or as I said, a vulture. So literally all of the depictions that we've seen thus far. And so Mute is the queen in this case. That's what she gets this title. We haven't heard that title before. The queen, the mother of the nation. And her name, Mute, Mount, Mot, roughly translates to mother. And she was said to have, have been around since as far back as the Nun of pre-creation, a part of the Agdod, the self-created goddess. Here we come again, full circle. Mute, who giveth birth, but was herself not born of any. Protected Ra as he traveled across the sky. Great mother, lady of all. Now, mute is kind of interesting because it's not that I can give you a lot of specificities. I've given you more specificities with the other goddesses, but mute is thrown in in um, conjunctive deities. Now, in Hinduism, we see the Trimirti. In, um, in Slavic, we saw that later on in Slavic paganism, they threw three gods together in on one. Now, this is where we always run into mute. So mute Isis Nekbet, the great mother, the great deity, the great lady. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in some of these depictions, which are kind of a little visceral, uh, as a winged goddess with an erect phallus, the feet of a lion and three heads. So we're getting heavy chimera vibes here. And if you want to look more into that, I did a whole talk on chimeras. There could be a lot of references to astrology here as well, astronomical ages. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, I'd have to spend my own time. Other mix-up deities, Mute, Wadget, and Bast, or Bastet. You have Mute, Sekhmet, Bast, and Manet. So this is a deity that you see thrown into the same pot several times over. The Lady of Egypt, the one, the mother of the land. Ah, okay, let's summarize. <laughs> Gosh. So what we're seeing in the Egyptians here and all these different goddess depictions, the seamlessness between the two. So is it too crazy to say that the originating mother is not all too different than what the daughter will become? And what I mean by that is that the great granddaughter will become the great grandmother. And so these distinctions between the goddesses as they move down are more of a contemporary categorical understanding of things. I think the seamlessness between these goddesses is attributing the archetypes of the powers found in women several times over. But what are all these goddesses? They are all beneficent. Even if they're associated with death, even if they're associated with plagues, they're serving the right purpose. They're protecting the house. They're protecting creation, or they're literally making creation. So in this way, and in this mythology, women get a really good gambit. I mean, Set was the bad boy, and that's a man. So it's as if men are doing their own like confrontations. And women are the ones keeping the house going. They're the ones keeping the order um, when it comes to this mythology, right? So mm. there's a lot of inspirations that come directly from shamanis shamanism here, 
which I've referenced in several times where their stories are, are um, giving purpose to why certain places are the way that they are, explaining why Egypt has deserts, explaining how the floods happen. Mm. Um, and there's a lot more to dive into when it comes to the symbolism here. I've only briefly touched on it. Um, some cases, the use of animals are literal, like the cats, you know, the mystique of the cat as a good symbol. But I think those references to the lioness, for instance, um, might not be just simply literal. I think there would be more to dig into when it comes to esoteric symbolism. Um, and there's a lot more underneath the surface of what I've talked about. I've tried, I've tried here to mostly uh, equate um, the listener with uh, the mind, the right mind of how to understand Egyptian philosophy. And also as a good point of learning of these goddesses and these ancient interpretations of the goddesses. Because as you know, in listening to this course, the original spirituality before all religions and paganisms was worshiping of the goddess. And so it's an interesting note here to see how it's been retained and maintained in this very maj paj way within Egyptian mythology as it was for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So I've done two, two talks on Egypt, so I'm going to leave it for now, but I hope this is a good acquainting.